Thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be back. This is not a bookend, by the way, so don't perceive this as the end of DevOps Days, just because I started the first one. Um, we don't have to end it here. But it's an honor to, to step in for my friend Patrick Dubois, who wasn't able to come. I can't fill his shoes. He's bigger than I am. But um, hopefully, uh, I can tell you something interesting. And uh, I would actually like to just tell you something interesting. It's a little bit short notice, so I was thinking what I could say. But um, I'd like to come back to something that I've been working on, actually, for 20 years now, which is really just sort of coming into use for the first time because of the scale of the cloud and the challenges that the cloud presents to us. And it has to do some, something to do with monitoring and understanding the behavior of computer systems. Um, so I'm probably best known for configuration management, but uh, in some ways I think that's misleading because my original conception of configuration management also included a kind of a cognitive loop. It's not just a, a fire and forget, as we say, uh, pushing out you know, changes to, to systems, but a continuous monitoring and assessment loop uh, to converge towards a desired end state. And so uh, monitoring was sort of, a, a observation was a big part of this uh, um, process. And we speak of uh, a cognitive system as one in which a system that uh, has sensors, it learns, it, it, it receives data, it learns and it adapts its behavior to the situation that it encounters. And it does this on a continuous basis. And we're starting to see a rise in the um, popularity and importance of cognitive systems in general. And there are many ways in which systems can be cognitive. You have to ask, what are the sensors? Are they people? Are they machines? Are they um, sensors? Um, but uh, in all cases, this, the important part is this loop, this adaptive loop, and the learning that goes on. Uh, Observation, of course, is kind of a, a messy issue. I, actually, we, my group at the university, we were one, amongst the first to do a kind of data-based study of computer systems back in the 1990s to understand how they, really, uh, how they really behave and what monitoring, what things we can really learn from monitoring systems. Um, and uh, it's a messy issue, which is uncomfortable for a lot of people in IT because we tend to like systems to be clean. We come from a machine background where machines are simple and predictable. And we tend to believe that there is a right answer to come out of any, any system, whether it's a monitoring system or, or a deployment system. Um, but that's already starting to change because um, the scale that we're seeing now in cloud forces us to confront issues that we've simply not had to uh, confront before. And I think especially as um, IT systems come closer to us in society as they become part of our everyday lives and they become more important to us. They become embedded in our, our environments, you know, self-driving cars and the systems that we rely on, even our lives that may depend on, are becoming important. This issue about understanding the behavior of systems has been thrust into the forefront of uh, our lives. So I want to talk a little bit about trust and how that relates to, to monitoring. So trust is a human issue. Um, and in IT, we don't really understand trust. You've probably heard about trust in connection with cryptography, in connection with SSH keys, and uh, all kinds of crypto solutions. But what we understand in IT is really antitrust. Because what we're obsessed with in IT is validating things. Yeah? Trust is that thing that we do when we don't validate something. Trust is the belief in, in the state of something or the outcome of something without verifying it. That's what trust is. But we, we believe in antitrust, as this Russian proverb sort of makes fun of, um, trust but verify. And we put a lot of effort into uh, verifying artificial credentials so that we don't need to um, uh, we, don't need, we don't have to rely on somebody's claims of who they are. Um, and then, on the other hand, we put a lot of effort into um, verifying credentials, but we place a lot of trust in the work that we do ourselves when we deploy code, when we write code. We may add some tests, we may you know, do some um, deep thinking about it, but 
we have a lot more trust in what we do ourselves than we do in uh, the customers and the clients and the remote users that come in. And it's natural because we know ourselves, at least some of us have some idea who we are. I won't speak for you. But um, clearly trust is an issue about knowing. It's about understanding the nature of something. And it's something that we learn over time and we even use to form expectations about behavior uh, in the future as well. And it's closely related to knowledge. It's intimately related to knowledge. And therefore, in this modern world of knowledge-based systems, AI and so on, we would expect it to become ever more important. Uh, but IT systems have previously really only dealt with data, not knowledge. And knowledge is a relationship. It's something that we build up over time. Data is something we get once. We measure it once. We get an answer once. We get an outcome once. We may collect multiple of these samples, but a datum is something that is a singular item. Knowledge is something that is collective, based on a relationship, based on a sample. And we're also very um, trained intimately trained in IT to think in terms of logic. So we believe in this sort of story that things are true or false, that we can reason about things in ways by saying, if such and such is true, if data equals value, then do this, else do that. And a lot of our decision making is based on data, not on knowledge, not on learning. This is um, going to be a problem. And what I want to suggest is that this is a little bit misplaced. And the reason it's misplaced is that logic, reasoning that we, we've been taught to do from university, if you like, is not an invariant property of systems as we scale them. What may be true, the logical stories we can talk about systems on a small scale may not remain true as we scale them. So, who's heard of Nyquist sampling law? Any information theorists? Okay, two out of 100, that's, uh, well. See if I can, <laughs> hopefully you'll have Googled this by the time I finish the slide. So trust is a cognitive relationship. What do I mean by that? It's based on learning. It's based on sampling. We have sensors, eyes that look, and a brain that learns and builds a kind of a model. And all cognitive observer relationships depend on scale uh, or the resolution, if you like, of, of our sensors, how much we can see, how often we can sample. You know that uh, digital music is sampled at uh, 44.1 kilohertz, if you're lucky, on a CD at least, because we believe that the highest frequencies the human ear can hear when we're young is about 20 kilohertz. So the idea is you sample about twice as much as the highest frequency change that you're trying to register. And the same thing is true of all information. If we're trying to capture information, learn information, build a trusted relationship with information, we need to sample it about twice as fast as, as, it, uh, as it changes. That's, that's Nyquist's law. Um, but then we have sort of, um, if we know something's changing quickly, we tend not to trust it so much because if it's changing quickly, we may not be able to build up that relationship and we may have to sample faster. So the faster something is changing, the more obsessed we become at sampling it faster. And we, you know that um, when you're, uh, if you're standing in front of an audience like this, for instance, you, you get a bit nervous, your brain starts to race faster and faster, and you sample your senses faster and faster, and you, it feels like time is going slower. We say a watched pot never boils, because when you're waiting for the thing to boil, you're constantly revisiting it, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet? And then the faster we go, the slower time seems to to go because relative to our sampling, uh, the world is not changing and then, so the resolution is changing. So the way we experience the world, the way we learn and the way we trust outcomes, our beliefs about behavior are intimately related to the scales we use, the rate at which we sample, the number of samples we make. And a simple technological answer to that is, okay, well, if we want to understand computer systems, monitoring, clouds, uh, vast systems of microservices, we need to sample them an awful lot. No problem. Let's just monitor the hell out of everything, pipe everything to uh, an Elasticsearch instance in the cloud, and do big data. 
But of course, the more data we have, the, the longer it takes to scan, the less relevant each datum is compared to the whole, and the less information we can understand from each change relative to the amount of information that we have to deal with. So scaling of information, scaling of cognition, is not a, it's not a trivial problem either. We can use logical algorithms, but they don't necessarily help us. So what is the solution? Apart from the sort of exponential growth of resources that we apply to the problem of monitoring computer systems, you know, it used to be that we could just, uh, we had a little embedded device and a microcontroller and we'd watch some output numbers easy. Now we deploy multiple uh, VMs and containers with intrusive uh, monitoring programs taking a large proportion of CPU time and, and kernel uh, resources, and then we pipe it all over a, a constrained network into another container which is resource constrained, and so on and so on. Really a, an exponential growth in resources because the more things we have, the more resources we pile on to monitor it. Um, and we've got to ask, what, what can we really expect to learn from this kind of process? Uh, what will we lose from applying this kind of process. And I wanted to come here just to gently, very gently, crush your dreams of being able to understand systems by approaching it in this kind of way because of scale. So let's step back for a second and think about how we approach trust in systems as we build them uh, and start to scale them in a way that we've really never approached before, the kind of scale we see today, we've never really had that before. And one of the key aspects is breaking things down into these component services, so microservices, if you like. And the strategy is, you know, the strategy of breaking things into pieces is on a direct collision course with our beliefs about logic, true and false, the truthness and falseness of, uh, of statements about the systems that we make. Uh, you all know this quote, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, classic classic quote, which is trying to say that um, just knowing that there is no problem is not the opposite of not knowing that there is a problem. Um, and this has actually deep consequences. But also I highlighted the word not, because in the sense of a logical not operation, which we all know from IT, this statement also doesn't make sense in terms of sets, De Morgan's laws and set theory, as you see from this diagram. Uh, the, the absence of evidence in the black case can, is, is not the, the, uh, the complement or the opposite of the other side, which is the evidence that there is no, that there is nothing. Because there's this piece, evidence that there is something missing from that. So the, the, the equation doesn't quite uh, balance, and so these things are really not the same. Um, so when we say something is not X, this is a reference to what's left when we take away X. And it's a set property. It's about partitioning, and we love to partition things in systems. So this is a question that we actually, answer, we actually ask a lot in computer science. And we're in danger of getting it wrong. Because on a small scale, we can make it approximately right. But as we scale things up, I want to argue that we, are, we actually can't keep it right. So in many systems, it would be considered strange if we measured x and found both x and not x at the same time. But actually, this is the normal state of affairs in scaled systems, in biology, in, uh, in sociology, in politics, as I'll say in a minute. George Boole, of Boolean algebra fame, um, is often misrepresented for his fascination with zero and one, with true and false. We sort of speak of Boolean logic and Boolean algebra as being ones and zeros, but he was very clear on this in his writings that um, you have a value of one which can be true and zero which is false, but all of the numbers in between also are possibilities and can be treated in the same way and should be, should be treated together with these extreme values of zero or one. And we've come to think about a number between zero or one as being something like a probability. Um, but that's not so clear either. I mean, how should we set that probability? On what basis should we estimate the likelihood of something or the unlikelihood of something? Well, 
We do that based on evidence or on learning, on observation, on cognitive uh, observation of the world in order to build a story that connects what we've seen in the past with what we're experiencing now and what we may experience in the future. So again, this cognitive story of observation comes back to haunt us. So then observation, okay, how do we scale observations? These different circles in my diagram uh, could be a sort of represent different scales. A big circle is a big scale, the smaller circles are smaller scales. And you see that on the small scale we may have black or white, it might be a very clear distinction between yes or no, true or false, black and white. But as we increase the size of these samples, we start to see mixed states. We start to aggregate information from multiple sources, possibly over multiple times, and we start to have some uncertainty. You know this ex famous expression, I don't know who said it, but uh, it's quite well known that if you have a clock, you know what time it is, but if you have two clocks, you're not sure. This is the truth of observation, right? The more you observe, the more uncertainty you experience, the bigger the scale or the smaller the resolution relative to one another, the uh, less certain we can be about the state of something because it's composed of multiple small states. So if we're going to break up systems into microservices, into microstate-like uh, independent uh, units that communicate and collaborate with one another, and then we want to characterize the state of these things as if they were an entity, we need to be very careful about how we, dis how we define that cognitive process, how we define that measurement and what it actually means to us. If our senses are only for black and white, then what happens uh, in a situation like this when we discover something new, like a color? Then suddenly, it's no longer a two-party system anymore. And we have to figure out how do we resolve. Is, is the measurement true or is it false? Or is it somewhere in between? How do we decide that? And how do we base our reasoning on it? This, of course, is a normal story in politics. We try to impose a two-party system on, so for example, in the UK, many countries have a two-party system. But uh, at any given time, who votes for which party or who, which party, true or false, left or right, conservative, democrat, whatever, uh, is represented is totally different in different parts of the country. It's a mixed state. But only one of them survives by voting. So we claim that there's an outcome. We make a measurement by voting, and we claim that there's a, a true-false outcome. It's a forced dichotomy, and one that we've uh, already seen can lead to some instability. So when we try to reason about systems, their behavior, their causal behavior, the relationship between cause and effect. We, uh, and we do this, of course, always in system diagnosis, if we're trying to figure out where errors occur, when anomalies occur, how unusual behaviors occur. We base it on the assumption that what we know about the present and possibly the future depends on what happened in the past. It's our assumption. Uh, but is that reasonable? Resolving uncertainty already means voting or aggregating. And the way that we do it is to create something like this uh, cone of shame. If you're, if you're a dog owner, you know these cones that dogs wear. It kind of looks like that. But in physics, we call this the light cone because it's the limits of this cone are the speed of light. You know how The idea is that in the past, only those signals that were traveling faster, less... Uh, less than or equal to the speed of light could have reached us in a certain amount of time. And in the future, we can only see things that light, a light signal could propagate. So there's this sort of limited cone of awareness or cone of cognition that we are able to see or able to perceive with a cognitive system, um, which tells us the state of the world. And our estimation of the future, our expectations of the future, will be based on this kind of shadow of the past, what we've seen before, and what we believe may continue to be true in the future. And these, whether we choose to aggregate in space or in time, 
basically decides whether we're using a frequentist or a Bayesian probability interpretation. If you know about statistics, you know there are these so-called competing interpretations of statistics. Basically, one of them aggregates over space, multiple instances, and one of them aggregates in time over repeated measurements in the same place. So it's a space-time view of, of uh, probability. And as we're diagnosing root cause, or so-called root cause, we're trying to uh, look at pathways through this cone of observation and say, we saw something funny happen here and now. Can I trace this back to some events that happened in the past to understand a story about why my system and my, with all my algorithms and whatnot behaved in this way. And if we're only able to measure true or false, black and white, we may miss all of these green, red, blue, yellow states that, that were floating around that influenced us in ways that we weren't able to understand. So again, the way that we choose to sample, the way that we can sample a system becomes quite important. In forensics, solving mysteries and anomalies, we follow these paths. And uh, we always want to see sort of as far back as we can. Um, but in the age of big data, the manufacturers of hard disks have tried to persuade us we need to keep absolutely everything in forever. You know, we, can, we have, it's so cheap. We can just keep everything forevermore and just, just try and find something, you know, two years later when you've kept absolutely everything in your life. Uh, if you, well, if you never clean your house, you... You may appreciate that, but those of us who like some kind of mental hygiene occasionally tidy things up and throw things away. And this is super important because if you are trying to tra train your cognitive system, your machine learning algorithm to recognize a cat, you can't just keep the entire history of the universe and try and train it on that. Because if you go back far enough, the cat doesn't look like a cat anymore. It looks like a you know, stegosaurus or a jellyfish or something. So at some point, the context in which a particular measurement, a particular characterization of our system is relevant and meaningful ceases to be true. Again, a cognitive learning system has to be limited in the scale over which it's relevant in space and in time. A system in the US may not be comparable to a system in Japan. A system in the 19th century may not be comparable to a system in the 21st century. These are limitations that we have to accept. Data are finite. So cognitive reasoning is not really just about a logical process, because logic itself is changing in that changing context. Our definition of true and false is changing. The, our ability to measure true and false is changing. The speed at which we can measure true and false is changing. And logic is also only one kind of story that we can tell about a system. It's a very constrained story. It's a very rigorous mathematical kind of um, story which we like because it seems to bring certainty. But actually, as we scale systems, there are many stories. Because we cannot define true and false anymore, our conventional ideas of logic simply can't apply. And we can define, we can describe behaviors in multiple ways, and we can see many different parts of a system behaving differently, and then coming together in the future to create some situation which seems unexpected. And how can we understand that? Well, it is simply what we call a many worlds problem. In the history of the 20th century, of course, as I'm sure many of you know, the, the greatest challenge we faced in the 21st century science was the, the admission that the understanding of measurement uh, was built on uncertainty. And the interaction between observer and measuring apparatus was key to being able to interpret what we see. This was in quantum mechanics, in subatomic physics. But the same, the same problem is starting to confront us now in IT as well because of the scale that we confront. It's really about the mismatch of, of scales. Now, what do we think we know about systems? In fact, knowledge, of course, uh, is composed of two kinds of stories. There are sort of boundary conditions, 
constraints, things that we might call intent, what we intend a system to do, what we design a system to do. And then there are algorithms and learning and observations where we interact with a system. And these form two separate cognitive loops. We're constantly going around these loops. One of them is a continuous delivery process. You have we make changes in the code, we look at the effects, we refactor the code, we go back. And the learning is in the code itself. The memory is the code. That's one cognitive loop. And we've got the monitoring system. So that the, the continuous delivery loop is the desired state. And then the actual state of the system is the one that we monitor. We monitor that on a totally different time scale. We're monitoring the kernel parameters, the memory consumption, the CPU allocation, the, uh, the deployment of the containers in a cloud, the, amount, the total number of instances, the network bandwidth, all of these things, totally different set of scales than we used to uh, describe the intended state of the system. How can we possibly compare these two systems? So our belief um, in systems is, is based on quite incompatible sources of information. And we try to make the best of this. I made sort of a, a, a made fun of this um, absence of evidence quote. We can turn that into an AI one to say that the intent to find evidence is not the same as evidence of intent. So if, if we're trying to figure out what a system is really doing by observing it, this may not be the same as actually the thing that you intended it to do. Because the, what it, the way it appears to behave and the way it's actually behaving underneath the covers may appear totally different to us depending on how we observe it. So our belief is based on an assessment of the stability and continuity of the system that we're building, the whole system, not just a one container or one microservice. We've kind of fooled ourselves into thinking that we can separate systems into modules and that modules are independent things. They're only independent in the, in the designer's mind. As soon as we put them together into a functioning system, they connect, they interact, they affect each other. Influence propagates from one to another. And we cannot say that a module is a failure domain or a module is um, um, a way of preventing... Uh, or it's even, we can't even identify it as the source of a bug because, of course, you may make an API change in one service which propagates to all of the rest of your services. And all you're really doing is pushing the responsibility onto somebody else by saying, I'm, I'm managing just this part of my code. This is just my responsibility. Uh, everyone else does, does their own thing, and we, we are weakly coupled. Yeah, it's weakly coupled if the whole thing breaks, right? So responsibility for the whole working system is different from this, this notion of localized... Um, changes. And if we want stability and continuity of the whole system and not just a single part of it, we need to understand what Nyquist's law tells us about sampling of the whole system. When is a property of the system true and false, not at this scale, but at this scale? A cognitive system is one that samples continuously and learns patterns that we can trust. So trust uh, is super important. And the enemy of certainty is entropy. Entropy is what happens when we lose the ability to distinguish between different things, when possibly different things end up looking the same. For example, when we elastic scale something and create multiple instances of a container. We may believe that these things are the same, even though there are multiple instances of them. Of course, they're not exactly the same, but we just choose to trust that they are the same by throwing away those bits of information that distinguish them that we don't care about. Trust is also a choice. It's the choice to not verify, to not validate, to not see every possible detail in a system. And trust is entropy. So entropy is really your friend when you're trying to scale something. How do we apply this to technology? Well. Um, our systems today just have so many moving parts. This is a huge challenge to us. Um, if we're going to know and trust IT systems like we do friends and people in the real world, we need a working relationship with them like we do with people in the real world. 
We need to use our brains, and our brains have limited cognitive faculties. We need to develop lasting cognitive relationships with them to learn their behaviors as we understand friends. Um, and that is, of course, is strongly scale dependent. I've been doing some work with IBM lately on a project they have called Istio. Uh, Istio, I don't know, if, has any, any of you heard of Istio? This is an attempt to equip container clusters from Kubernetes with um, sidecar containers that can look inside the containers. You're not supposed to look inside the containers, right? It's supposed to be black boxes. But we can cheat, we can set up a shared resource system and, and still look inside to some extent. Um, now this is super complicated because not only are these, these things changing so fast that uh, you know, um, both redeployments and, and resource, ac uh, resource allocations are changing so fast it's beyond our comprehension as human, human beings to comprehend as a cognitive system. So we can't use our brains directly. It even doesn't help to try and collect a bunch of metrics. We're using the same monitoring systems we've been using for the last 30 years, but now with a fancy new graphical in user interface. Because those, the collection of those data is getting slower and slower and taking longer and longer, and we still have no more information than we had 30 years ago. And the information that we're seeing is about the shared platform, not about the individual processes. So we're actually looking at the effect of 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 or 1,000 processes together, overlapping and interfering. So we couldn't possibly hope or expect in any reasonable version of reality to understand our software based on those graphs coming out of the monitoring system. But we do. This project at IBM, the idea is to, to use machine learning, to use these cognitive AI techniques that can work much faster than we can, that can collect data and build that relationship on the time scales and on the spatial scales that are appropriate to the deployments of the cloud, to see if we can compensate for our own lack of mental faculties and condense the information down. Forget about big data. Useless. We want just enough data that we can fit inside our heads. That's all we want. That's, that was the idea behind microservices in the first place just enough code you can put inside your head and understand. So to scale that problem, the cognitive problem, we can start to use these artificial reasoning systems, these artificial techniques for finding stories through the, um, through the pathways of measurements and events in this cone of measurement, this cognitive cone, and see if we can really piece together a picture artificially in human language terms, and in, in terms of stories and in terms of concepts that we can understand as humans, to kind of close this impedance mismatch between what we can understand and what is possible to understand about the cloud system. The same thing really applies to all kinds of systems where we're trying to manage state over a wide area. Uh, these consensus systems that people are quite fond of now in the belief that they can really brute force maintain a single version of true and false over an, a large area. It doesn't scale. Blockchain, similar story in, in money and in finance. Again, trying to have consistency over a, a wide area. It's slow, it's arduous, it scales not in the way that we probably expect. So can we really maintain trustworthy relationship with our modern systems with so many moving parts? Because there are so many moving parts in our modern systems. This microservice model tries to modularize this for developers uh, to apply only to the code and our inter interactions with the code. But it can't include the full system behavior because we're just not equipped for that. We don't know enough about the scaling of knowledge for all the stakeholders in a system in a complete society of processes uh, over a large area at all possible scales. The uncertainties around the observation in the cloud are now just tremendous. Uh, we pile wrapper upon wrapper, container on VM upon physical host, and we pipe it through these underpowered networks into underpowered instances of Elasticsearch, and then we call it back through 10 layers of APIs. 
And there's an enormous growth in the overhead and in the amount of data involved in collecting just a single item of information about our systems. <coughs> These pretty monitoring displays that we're creating, not to name names, simply don't help us to find anything trustworthy of information about the systems that we're looking at. So we need to do better, and that's really the, the idea behind this, this project with this TO and applying machine learning techniques. So what I want to suggest to you is that as you go back to your work, try and think about this problem, try and think about the scale, and ask yourself, at what scale am I training my telescope? At what scale am I observing and interacting with the systems that I'm working with, managing, building? And how are you comparing what you believe about the future to what you saw in the past? How much continuity do you expect of state and of trusted properties, behaviors? How much continuity and trustworthiness do you see in those things um, in your systems? I want to thank you all for attending DevOps Days Oslo and wish you all a safe journey back to your respective homes. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mark. And with that, this year's DevOps Days Oslo is over. It's been a pleasure seeing you all, and we all hope you had a good time. So thanks, and see you next year. <laughs>